I want to thank you all for attending this very special event uh, that is part of uh, our graduate uh, lecture series. And thanks to Pascal Vessel for organizing it and promoting it. And to the uh, two graduate students associations uh, that are also promoting this event, our own association from modern languages, and uh, also the association from uh, history department who are providing refreshments. Uh, so I hope you can stay at the end and have, uh, have a drink and something to eat. And I also want to thank uh, Aurora Mortillo, my colleague, for establishing the first contact with our guest, uh, Joe Lavandi, who is here with us. And she's a very busy person. She flies all over the world to give uh, uh, speeches. So we are very honored to have her with us. Most of you already know her, but I will introduce I'll introduce her very briefly. Um, Dr. Joe Lavandi is professor of uh, Spanish at New York University. And um, she's also there, the director of the King Juan Carlos of the Spain Center. Uh, she's a founding editor of uh, the Journal of Spanish Cultural Studies. And uh, she directs um, uh, the book series, Remapping Cultural History. Um, she's a specialist in uh, modern Spanish cultural history, and her most recent publications uh, are a volume of lit um, literature in Oxford University Press, uh, and um, she also co-edits uh, volumes of Europe and Latin cinema, and a companion to Spanish. She is currently authoring uh, a cultural history of modern Spanish literature and an oral history of cinema going in the uh, 1940s and 50s in Spain. And uh, her research interests are uh, literature, film, photography, popular culture, gender, and memory studies. And, uh, she has many, many publications. If, if you do a search in Modern Language Association bibliography, you, uh, you get more than 121. In, uh, oh, really? I never tried it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, um, this, the information that I gave you is very brief. I, I'm not going to give a list of the over uh, 120 publications <laughs> that uh, you had. Uh, the presentation today is uh, entitled The Multiple Temporalities of Memory, The Contested Memory of the Spanish Civil War in Contemporary Spain. Um, uh, so let me uh, welcome Dr. Yola Banji for this talk. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, By the way, can you hear? Can you hear well? Yeah, shall, shall I do a little test? Because I can move to the podium with a microphone. If pe you prefer me to go to the microphone? OK. Which one? They prefer this one. OK, right. Uh, is that better? Is it on? It doesn't seem to be on. How do I put it on? Ah, on. Okay, <laughs> fine. Okay, just press the switch. Um, that sounds as though it's better. Is that, is that okay? Great. Um, I'd like to start by um, thanking Asuncion Gomez for her very generous welcome, for having looked after me so well since I arrived um, yesterday afternoon. Um, I would like to thank uh, Aurora Morcillo and the Department of History for the uh, original contact. Um, I have um, share something in com common with Aurora, who is from Granada, and I also have a house in the province of Granada, so I've enjoyed meeting Aurora um, in her home territory as well as at academic events. Um, so thank you to the Department of Modern Languages, thank you to the School of International and Public Affairs, um, and thank you to everybody who's been looking after me so well. 
um, since I arrived. Um, so what I want to do in this talk um, is really um, do more than one thing. Um, I'm going to start for people who may not be familiar with the topic, but I hope it will be useful for people. Should I be a bit further away to not sure I have to get this right? So is that better? Um, for people who are familiar with the topic, I hope that the way I organize the information um, will also be useful. Um, but I'm going to start with a chronological run through the debates in the Spanish media um, since the late 1990s about how to deal with the legacy of the Francoist repression, both during and after the Spanish Civil War. And what I hope that run through will do is set out the context, multiple contexts, and also show how all the different bits fit together. Um, after that, I'll move on to a series of critical reflections on these debates um, and issues relevant to them. Um, and what I want to do in the process um, is offer some thoughts about the ways in which memory variously intersects with and complicates time. Um, I'll insist on the international context of the historical memory debates in Spain because they haven't taken place in isolation. I think it's really important to be aware of that. Um, and since I believe there are some people here who are not familiar with Spanish, though it's quite hard to find people in Miami who don't speak Spanish, um, I've been asked to um, give the talk in English, so I should be giving um, all terminology and um, titles um, in English translation. Um, okay, so to start the historical run through, um, the term historical memory, I'm going to come back to explaining that a little bit later, became current in Spain after the publication of a pioneering book of 1996 by Paloma Aguilar Fernández, which I'm sure many of you know, um, in English, Memory and Amnesia, the role of the Spanish Civil War in the transition to democracy. As is well known, Aguilar's thesis was that the consensus politics that made possible the transition from dictatorship to democracy on General Franco's death in 1975 was based on a so-called pact of oblivion with regard to the violent past agreed by all political parties at the time. Writing in 1996, Aguilar analyzed this process without judging it. However, her book triggered, or at least reinforced, an emerging insistence on the need to remember the Francoist repression, which from now on, thanks to her book, would be irrevocably linked to a new questioning of Spain's transition to democracy, which previously had been regarded as exemplary. What made the ensuing memory debates explosive was not so much the topic of the Francoist repression in itself, as the suggestion that the political transition of the late 1970s and early 1980s had been deficient. What's at stake in Spain's memory debates is the quality of the nation's democracy during the transition, but also in the present, a present which is still governed by the legislation passed during the transition, that is the 1977 amnesty law and the 1978 constitution. To talk of historical memory in Spain, then, is to establish a dialogue between three different historical periods, the time of the Civil War and its aftermath, the time of the transition, and the time of the present. This fundamentally erodes the linear concept of history which underpinned the transition, conceived as the forward march toward democratic modernity. If Aguilar's harnessing of the memory of the Civil War to the transition's pact of oblivion resonated so strongly, it was because she was writing in an international climate in which calls to remember the victims of political repression had, had acquired significant legal and moral weight. The inauguration of the Washington Holocaust Memorial Museum in 1993 was the paradigmatic example of the so-called memory turn of the 1990s, analyzed in Andreas Huysen's book, Twilight Memories of 1995. Huysen explained the new culture of commemoration as a response to the postmodern loss of belief in the master narratives of political left and right, 
which should sustain belief in linear progress towards a better future. Crucial to this new culture of commemoration was the memorialization of victims. In this respect, the Holocaust, more commemorated now than ever, has played a fundamental role. This insistence on victims was in turn related to developments in international law in the 1990s when the concept of transitional justice was elaborated. Spain's transition to democracy may have been hailed as exemplary at the time, but the model of political transition on which transitional justice was based was not that of Spain, but that of countries like Argentina, Chile and South Africa, characterized by the creation of truth and reconciliation commissions. Transitional justice is grounded in the concept of crimes against humanity, such as genocide, first defined at the Nuremberg trials of 1945, confirmed as a principle of international law by the United Nations in 1946, and ratified by the 1998 Rome Statute, which set up the International Criminal Court in The Hague. The key factor affecting Spain, whose mass killings took place mostly between 1936 and the late 1940s, is that crimes against humanity are deemed by the United Nations and the International Criminal Court to have no statute of limitations, meaning that those responsible can be brought to trial under international law no matter how many years have elapsed. The official reports on the crimes of the military dictatorships in Argentina and Chile in 1983 and 1991 respectively had considerable media impact in Spain. So too did the presence of Spanish troops in Bosnia under NATO at the time of the worst ethnic massacres there in 1995. The creation of the International Criminal Court in 1998 offered a legal framework for the arrest in London that same year, 1998, of Chile's General Pinochet, after the Spanish Supreme Court judge, Baltasar Garzón, issued an international warrant for his arrest. Garzón's initiative highlighted the fact that, unlike Chile and Argentina, post-dictatorship Spain had not had any truth and reconciliation commission, nor indeed had it ordered any report on the victims of the Francoist repression, despite the fact that the Franco dictatorship had in 1940 launched a massive inquiry documenting the victims of republican violence. The first Spanish historical study devoted specifically to the victims of the Francoist repression appeared precisely the following year, 1999, that Santos Julia's edited volume called Victims of, the Spanish, of, Victims of the Civil War. It was in this climate that in the year 2000, the journalist Emilio Silva founded the Association for the Recovery of Historical Memory to assist families wanting to exhume and give proper burial to their Republican relatives shot and buried in unidentified mass graves after exhuming his own Republican grandfather in the first exhumation to be carried out in Spain with a media presence and forensic experts. Silva was able to mobilize public opinion because this first public exhumation coincided with left-wing critiques of the jingoistic state commemorations, for example, of Spain's loss of empire, Philip II, Charles V, etc., organized by the conservative popular party governments of 1996 to 2004, and the media outcry provoked by the popular party government's proposed reforms to the national history curriculum. The resulting political polarization was reinforced by the publication in the early 2000s of a series of best-selling neo-Francoist interpretations of the Spanish Republic and Civil War by negationist journalists such as Pio Moa and César Vidal. In 1999 and 2001, the Popular Party had refused to vote for parliamentary motions condemning the military uprising of 1936 that had started the Civil War. Although in 2002 it did join all other political parties in recognizing the victims of the Franco dictatorship, it again refused to condemn the uprising and the dictatorship, a position it upholds to this day, and it is, of course, currently in power in Spain. 
In this climate, the new socialist prime minister, Rodriguez Zapatero, announced on his 2004 election victory that he would draw up a historical memory law to consider what were appropriate and inappropriate ways of memorialising the past. The passage of this law through Parliament from 2006 to 2007, now officially titled Reparations Law, though the original name Historical Memory Law has stuck, produced a hysterical response in the right-wing media. Shortly before the law's implementation, at the end of 2007, the Catalan Autonomous Government set up its own institution devoted to memorialising the past, called Democratic Memorial, and I shall say more about Democratic Memorial a bit later. This same year, 2007, saw an ugly polemic between historians for and against the historical memory movement, and I'm going to come back to that debate as well. Also in 2007, the Pope, after the Spanish church hierarchy, had accused the historical memory movement of being sectarian, beatified 498 Catholics murdered in the Republican zone during the Civil War. In 2008, at the request of victims' associations, Judge Garzón agreed to investigate over a thousand cases of forced disappearances in the nationalist zone during the Civil War. The term disappeared, imported from Chile and Argentina, had started to be used in Spain to refer to the victims of the Francoist repression around the year 2002. Garzón asked various public and religious institutions and citizens groups to supply documentation on extrajudicial murders committed during or after the Civil War. Most of these bodies denied having any information, which is completely untrue, they had, but the citizens groups compiled a list of just over 130,000 documented cases. And I'd like to compare that with the official number of victims of military dictatorship in Chile stands at 2,279. The official number for Argentina is 8,961. Um, in Spain, it's 100 and over 130,000. At this point, the Attorney General declared that Garzón lacked competence to investigate the crimes of Francoism and ordered him to pass the investigation to the relevant local courts, which did nothing. In 2009, two proto-fascist groups brought a lawsuit against Garzón, accusing him of prevarication in taking on investigation of the crimes of Francoism. Assorted far-right groups filed two other lawsuits against him. In 2012, Garzón was barred from serving as a judge in Spain on being found guilty of prevarication in his handling of a major corruption case but was found not guilty of prevarication in agreeing to investigate the crimes of Francoism. Nevertheless, the Spanish Supreme Court declared that under the 1977 amnesty law, such crimes cannot be investigated. The third case against Garzón was dropped on a technicality. And then the last bit of the chronological puzzle, um, though it starts a little bit earlier in 2002, um, in 2002, a historian and a subsequent Catalan TV documentary had revealed the systematic removal of babies from women political prisoners in Francoist post-war jails and their selling for illegal adoption to childless right-wing families, something that was already known to have happened under the military in Argentina in the late 70s and early 1980s. In 2009, this turned into a major scandal with the discovery that the practice had continued with babies of poor, mother, of poor mothers right through to the 1990s. In the year 2011, the socialist government set up a commission to decide the future of the Valley of the Fallen, the massive monument outside Madrid to the Francoist dead in the Civil War and Franco's own burial place, where 34,000 34, bodies um, are entombed, mostly ident unidentified, with a significant number now known to be Republican dead who had been exhumed and reburied without their families' consent. 
the Commission's report produced after the Popular Party's election victory in November of that year, 2011, concluded that Franco's body should be removed since he was not one of the wartime fallen and that a memorial should be built at the site displaying the names of the dead on both sides in the war. The report has not been implemented. The debates on the Frankfurt repression have now been ousted from the media by Spain's economic crisis, but historical studies on the topic continue to roll off the press, most notably the historian Paul Preston's monumental The Spanish Holocaust, published in 2012, it had appeared slightly before in Spanish translation. The previously taboo subject of the complicity of the civilian population is finally starting to be tackled, though so far only a young British historian, Peter Anderson, has dared to broach the subject. So that's the chronological overview. Um, now I'd like to move on to some reflections. The term historical memory appears in Maurice Halpfax's The Collective Memory, published posthumously in 1950. For Halpfax, historical memory is a society's view of its past prior to its members' lived experience, transmitted through written or visual documents or through commemorative acts. Today we will probably call it cultural memory, the term coined by Jan Asman. The fact that in Spain historical memory is used exclusively of contemporary Spaniards' views of the civil war and dictatorship equates it with the collective memory of a period in the national past that is still alive today in the double sense that it continues to affect the present and that there are living witnesses who can narrate their experiences of it. This contradicts Hulkfacht's definition of historical memory as the vision of a period prior to lived experience. The fact that eyewitnesses of the war and immediate post-war period will not be with us much longer partly explains the overwhelming attention paid by historians to the civil war and early dictatorship by comparison with other periods in Spain's history. For example, no Spanish historians are, to my knowledge, questioning empire. Good research topic if you want one. Um, the acrimonious 2007 polemic between the historians Santos Julia on the one hand and Francisco Espinosa and Pedro Ruiz Torres on the other focused on the concept of collective memory, which they all saw as synonymous with historical memory. Espinosa criticised Julia for his hostility for the historical memory movement, which he'd expressed in various publications of the previous year. In those publications, Julia had insisted that historians had already treated the civil war and dictatorship exhaustively, including during the transition to democracy, and that what was needed was not memory, subjective and partial, but historical analysis, critical, critical and objective. In his reply to Espinosa, Julia attacked the El article on collective memory by Ruiz Torres, in the same online dossier. Julia insisted that collective memory is a non sequitur since only individuals can remember. His article provoked Ruiz Torres to reply with a meticulous exposition of the ideas of Halpfax, which is hugely useful for Spanish readers largely unfamiliar with the now voluminous body of work in memory studies written mostly in English, French and German. Ruiz Torres clarified that Halkfax had insisted precisely that only individuals memory, that, sorry, that only individuals remember, but that no individual can remember without being inserted into a social frame that determines what is remembered and how. Thus, for Halkfax, collective memory is the memory of an individual as a member of a particular group. As Halpvac insists, every individual is a member of several groups, family, gender, class, profession, nation, etc. And all groups include divergent views within the social frame of their common interests. Ruiz Torres additionally explained how, for Halpvac, memory is not the registration in the mind of a past event, but a process of construction of the past in keeping with the interests of the present. For this reason, every historical period constructs a different version of the past. 
Thus, what memory shows us is not what the past was like, but the concerns of the present time of remembering, which includes its desires for the future. Ruiz Torres's reply additionally summarized a number of cognitive theories of memory, which demonstrate that knowledge, the goal of historical study, as Julia had insisted, that knowledge is only possible because the individual is able to remember a multiplicity of techniques and facts. In short, memory is not a depository where a piece of the past is stored, but a faculty that makes possible the transmission of information. The mistaken idea that memory gives us a piece of the past can partly be attributed to the popularization of Freud's archaeological metaphors. Freud was fond of comparing the unconscious to a process of geological sedimentation whose bottom level, preserving the remains of the most remote past, is the most intact. It's virtually impossible not to project this analogy, which supposes that the unconscious is a place and not a process, onto the images of the exhumations of mass graves, which have become commonplace since the year 2000, thanks to the activities of the Association for the Recovery of Historical Memory. The expression recovery of historical memory has rightly been criticized. When it's associated with the exhumation of graves, it reinforces the mistaken idea that memory recovers a piece of the past that has been buried by a double material and psychological repression. Memory is indeed like geological sedimentation in that it superimposes successive historical times. But in the case of memory, the various temporal planes interfere with each other in a creative process geared towards the present and the future. If memory is the transmission of knowledge, then the absence in the 2007 historical memory law of any mention of education is a serious omission. In their book, The War We've Been Told About, Jesus Izquierdo Martin and Pablo Sanchez Leon note that the only knowledge of the Civil War that was transmitted to them when growing up as, as grandchildren of those who lived through the war consisted of the Francoist myths they assimilated at school in the dictatorship's last years, plus, in both their cases, stories told in the family about a grandfather killed by the Reds, since during the transition, the topic was not discussed at school or university. Izquierdo Martín and Sánchez León, both young historians, note that these family, these family stories made a big impact on them because of the emotion with which they were narrated, which gave them the impression of a past that was still alive. In practice, although both had a grandfather who was a victim of Republican reprisals, one was a conservative and the other a liberal. The fact that so many Spanish families have relatives who support or fought for opposing sides in the war suggests that the transmission of these family stories ought to facilitate some kind of reconciliation, not in the sense of everyone being in agreement, neither feasible nor desirable, but of accepting that one can live with and even love people who hold opposing beliefs. The fact that this has not happened suggests that these family stories have not been sufficiently valued as a means of effective, affective and moral knowledge. Izquierdo Martín and Sánchez León describe how, although in later life they distanced themselves ideologically from these family stories of the Red Terror, nevertheless they continue to be moved by their narration. It doesn't make sense to criticise the historical memory debates for instrumentalising the past, that's the main complaint of the political right, since memory by definition transmits those aspects of the past that concern the present. In this respect, memory is no different from history, since historical studies are also conceived as interventions in the present. The differences between Aguilar's original 1996 study and her substantially revised edition of 2008, with the new title, The Politics of Memory and the Memory of Politics, say much about the change of intellectual climate in the 12 years between the two versions. The revised edition, published the year after the historical memory law, supposes that memory of the Civil War affects the present and not just the time of the transition. 
It includes a new chapter, Theorizing Memory, which acknowledges the memory studies boom of the last 15 years. It also has a new closing chapter comparing transitional justice in Spain, Chile, and Argentina. In fact, that comparison is anachronistic since it evaluates the Spanish transition in terms of a legal concept, transitional justice, that did not exist at the time of the Spanish transition to dem democracy. But insistence on the reparative legislation passed in Chile and Argentina is valuable in reinforcing the need for reparative justice in today's Spain. Ángel Loredo has noted the difference between the testimony given on two different historical occasions, 1978 and 2003, by the aristocrat José Luis Villalonga of his teenage experience of being forced to participate in a Francoist firing squad during the Civil War. In the 1978 documentary, The Old Memory, Villalonga depicted this horrific experience as an indication that the war was a collective madness. The depoliticized view of the war propagated under late Francoism and the transition to democracy. In the 2003 television documentary, The Graves of Silence, in keeping with the new discourse of victimhood, Villalonga cast himself in the role of victim when narrating the same experience. These different accounts, which disprove any notion that memory gives us the past as it was, help us understand how the view of the war had changed in the 25 years between 1978 and 2003, including for those who had lived it at first hand. Julia, Julia is right to point out that there was no forgetting of the Civil War during the transition, when an impressive number of historical studies on the topic were published. But as in the case of the old memory, which interviewed major Republican figures, these earlier studies were mostly studies of the political protagonists. Historians only started to focus systematically on the Francoist repression, that is on victims rather than heroes, after Julia's own 1999 volume, Victims of the Civil War. In subordinating the past to the present, memory necessarily calls linear time into question. In a recent book of 2009, Michael Rothberg has proposed the concept of multidirectional memory. Rothberg rejects the notion of competitive victimhood elaborated by Tony Judd with regard to the celebrations of victims of the Holocaust in Western Europe and victims of Stalinism in Eastern Europe proposing, this is Rothberg, proposing that memory discourses do not so much compete with each other as obey a creative process of hybridization. Rothberg's thesis is that the memory of the Holocaust owes much to the memory of the ills of colonialism elaborated after World War II. This makes it possible to unhook the memory of victims from exclusionary identity politics, quoting Rothberg. Quote, memories are not owned by groups, nor are groups owned by memories. Rather, the borders of memory and identity are jagged. What looks at first like my own property often turns out to be a borrowing or adaptation from a history that might initially seem foreign or distant. Memory's anachronistic quality, its bringing together of now and then, here and there, is actually the source of its powerful creativity the ability to build new worlds out of the materials of older ones, end quote. I've already mentioned the debt of the discourses on the Francoist repression in today's Spain to the discourses on political victims in other countries, the Holocaust, Southern Cone, Bosnia, discourses that had been elaborated previously but concern mass killings that took place after the Francoist repression. It's becoming increasingly frequent to invoke the Holocaust in studies of the Francoist repression, not to recognize the debt of Spain's memory discourses to those on the Holocaust, though that debt is there, but because if it can be demonstrated that the Francoist repression was a crime against humanity, then the crimes of Francoism have no statute of limitations before international law. 
In Spain's case, where the object of debate is a civil war and its divisive aftermath, the rival memory discourses coexist at an intranational level between political right and left. Perhaps it's utopian to imagine that sorry, um, perhaps it's utopian to imagine that those concerned to celebrate the victims of Republican and Francoist violence, respectively, may one day come to recognize how their conflicting discourses feed off each other. In saying this, I'm not suggesting that we should play down or elide the very real political differences between the two sides in the Civil War. What I am suggesting is that what's needed, and at present I think is sadly lacking, is mutual respect between those who celebrate victims who died for very different political causes. Memory is necessarily anachronistic, always post because it views the past through the lens of the present. This requires us, sorry, this requires it to contain a greater or lesser degree of forgetting. Aguilar is right to insist that if during the transition politicians and most Spaniards did not want to talk about the past to avoid it upsetting the restoration of democracy, that means that memories of the violent past were still strong. A similar mix of memory forgetting is seen in the popular party's current defense of the transition, and particularly of the 1977 amnesty law, despite the fact that its predecessor, the Popular Alliance, refused to vote for the amnesty law, and half its deputies did not vote for the 1978 constitution. Conversely, certain sectors of the left, which at the time of the transition pushed strongly for the amnesty law, Today, it criticized the left at the time of the transition for supposedly having capitulated to Francoist, oppress Francoist pressure in approving it. Indeed, all of Spain's major political parties have reneged on their past. The Popular Party in denying its Francoist legacy, the Socialist Party in breaking with Marxism in 1979, and the Communist Party in accepting the monarchy as the price of legalization so it could stand in the first democratic elections of 1977. However, this is a matter of complaint only if we regard history as continuity. If we accept that history is discontinuous, then such breaks with the past should not surprise us, though of course they should be acknowledged publicly. The tension between these two views of history as continuity or break corresponds roughly to that existing between the opposing concepts of memory as inheritance or memory as burden. Richard Turdiman has indicated that early 20th century modernism, including Freud, was mainly concerned with memory as something from which one had to liberate oneself. It may be useful to situate the transition's suspicious attitude to the past in this context, it was, after all, the moment when Spaniards voraciously devoured the modernist literary canon that had been banned under dictatorship. By contrast, the 1990s memory turn insists on the ethical duty to acknowledge the past legacy. The notion of history as burden corresponds to the Freudian therapeutic model. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to get something to drink. The notion of history as burden corresponds to the Freudian therapeutic novel, according to which healing is achieved by freeing oneself from the past grip in order to move on, though only after having worked through the painful memory. Spain's tradition, transition to democracy can be criticized for having wanted to leave the past behind without passing through this prior stage. By contrast, the notion of history as inheritance corresponds to a model of familial or patrimonial transmission based on the notion of affiliation. The view of history as break finds its most extreme expression in the trauma theory that was so influential in the 1990s. The traumatic event is that which could not be registered in consciousness because it did not fit available categories of thought. 
It is, however, registered at the level of sensation. It thus escapes voluntary recall, but periodically erupts into the present, replaying itself on the body, a hole in the past which fractures the present. As Roger Luckhurst has noted, this analysis allows two responses to trauma. The medical response, which encourages the trauma victim to incorporate the traumatic experience into a coherent narration so as to overcome it, and the aesthetic response, which privileges recre recreation of the traumatic fissure that makes coherent narration impossible, so as to make readers or viewers appreciate the, the extent of the damage. Both responses, the desire to close the wound, the desire to keep it open, obey an ethical impulse, that of healing the victim, that of bearing witness to the hurt. The aesthetic response to trauma produced an extraordinary avant-garde literature in Chile and Argentina under military dictatorship. For example, the no novels of Diamela El Tit in Chile or Ricardo Pilia in Argentina, both of which preceded the theorization of trauma in the United States. But the innumerable novels on the Civil War and Francoist repression that have been produced in Spain over the last 15 years are overwhelmingly and, I would say, depressingly realist. This is partly because of the commodification of the literary market since the 1990s, not just in Spain, but also because of a desire to provoke empathy in the reader, encouraging identification with the victims depicted. But realist narrative can never capture the traumatic experience of rupture with existing categories of the real. The same criticism can be made of the vast number of feature films that have been made on the Civil War and its aftermath. Only the Mexican director, Guillermo del Toro, has succeeded in approximating to the horror of the war and its aftermath by eschewing realism for the conventions of precisely horror. Empathy is also the dominant note of the photographs and video documentaries that have recorded the exhumations of mass graves. While the exhumations themselves explicitly aim to produce closure for the victim's relatives through ceremonies honoring and offer proper burial to the previously unacknowledged victims, the visual documentation of the process aims to produce viewer empathy with the bereaved and with the victims whose stories they tell. Marianne Hirsch has elaborated the concept of the affiliative gaze demanded of us by family photos, even if we never knew the relative depicted. Something similar occurs with the photos and videos of exhumations, which turn those depicted, including the victims who family, whose family photos are displayed, into figurative relatives. This is ethically fitting, and yet Izquierdo Martin and Sancho Sanchez Leon remind us that to identify with figures from the past is to forget that they had values and ideas that are not ours today. They therefore criticize citizens' initiatives that aim to produce identification with the pre-war republic. Like Rothberg, Izquierdo Martin and Sanchez Leon pr propose a concept of solidarity not with a we in the past, but with others who we accept as such. This is especially important if we're to avoid the temptation to convert the losers of history into martyrs or moral victims, that is, exemplary models. A Republican was the great loser, not just with Vancouver's victory in 1939, but also at the time of the transition when no Republican Party was allowed to stand for election. No matter how much we may sympathize with the Republic, we should remember that Republicanism in 1936, in 1977, at the time of the transition, and today, does not mean the same thing. If the past is not a familial or patrimonial inheritance, or if it is so only in the sense that it's a legacy of ancestors who are not like us, neither is history totally discontinuous. The transition can't be seen as a, seen as a complete break with the preceding dictatorship, since Spain's shift to a neoliberal market economy and ethos 
dates back to the dictatorship's development plans of the 1960s. The goal of national reconciliation also dates back to 1956, when it was adopted as official policy by the Communist Party. If previously the Republic and Civil War were studied together as a package, supposing that they represent a historical continuity, a practice maintained by negationist writers like Moa and Vidal, bent on blaming the Republic for the Civil War. Today, the norm is to take the war and the dictatorship together as a package, since the dictatorship continued the repression unleashed during wartime. Paul Preston has rightly called the Franco dictatorship the continuation of the war by other means. Michael Richards reminds us that in most of the country, the war ended before 1939 on occupation by Franco's troops. Thus, the post-war began during the war. Richard also, Richards also reminds us that the forgetting of the past, or at least the desire to leave it behind, started not with the transition, but with the massive emigration from the countryside in the 1950s and 1960s. As Richards notes, a whole generation of migrants sacrificed itself so their children would have a better life. Their temporal referent was the future and not the past from which they were escaping. We may add that the massive migration from small villages to the anonymity of the city meant the loss of the social frame that makes memory possible. If victims became the privileged subjects of memory in the 1990s, it was not only because of the institution of transitional justice and the influence of trauma theory, but also because of the rediscovery in this propitious climate of the work of Walter Benjamin. In his famous thesis on the philosophy of history, Benjamin proposed that if history is written by the victors, victors memory rescues the losers. Benjamin's messianic vision of memory combines continuous, sorry, actually messianic vision of history, combines continuous and discontinuous conceptions of time, since it sees the historian's task as that of rescuing from oblivion the thwarted utopian projects that can provide an inspiration for the future, thereby creating an alternative continuity. This messianic vision has inspired numerous studies of the Holocaust including in Spain those of the philosopher Reyes Mate, which explicitly relate the need to rescue the inheritance of the victims of the Holocaust with the need to rescue the inheritance of the victims of the Francoist repression. While impeccable from an ethical point of view, this risks homogenizing different kinds of victim. The stress on victims apart from coming dangerously close to the Catholic martyrology that has dominated the historical memory of the Spanish right, can eclipse the agency that these individuals possessed in their lifetime before being made into victims against their will. It's important to remember that the victims of both Franquist and Republican reprisals did not choose to be victims. To regard them as martyrs is to misuse the term. In this respect, I found healthy the Catalan Democratic Memorial's insistence that its mission is not to honour victims, but to honour those who fought for democracy, hence the organisation's name, Democratic Memorial. I also find admirable its insistence that memory is not a duty, but a civic right, and its decision to set up not a commemorative site, but a forum for debate between different positions. Democratic Memorial has, however, been criticised for supposing that all Republican victims were fighting for democracy, forgetting that many anarchist communists were fighting to abolish bourgeois parliamentarianism. Here, too, we do well to heed Martín Izquierdo and Sánchez León's reminder that Spaniards of the 1930s had values and ideas that are not those of today. No matter how important it may be, to give civic recognition to victims denied it in the past, perhaps we should not allow ourselves to be totally seduced by the Benjaminian notion that victims represent the thwarted potential of the past that can be rescued as a utopian project for the future. 
an idea that runs the risk of supposing that victims were right just because their project was cut short. Or at least maybe we need to think about victims differently. Here, another German thinker, the historian Reinhard Kozelek, can perhaps help us. In the practice of conceptual history, Kozelek suggests that in order to learn from history, we should look not to the victims who died, but to the losers who survived. What Kozelek finds valuable about survivors is that they were forced to ask why everything turned out differently from what they had imagined. That is, victims can give us useful lessons for the future, precisely because they're forced to reflect on the fact that they got things wrong. Thank you very much. Um, that, that's a good question. Um, I don't think any documentaries are not biased, but they declare their bias, which for me is the best thing to do. I mean, I, I think there's no such thing as lack of bias. I mean, the best known and most effective ones are those made for Catalan television by Montserrat Mingo and Ricard Bellis, which I'm sure you know. Um, they make their bias absolutely clear. Um, what they do, though, is intercut interviews with victims um, with showing documentation from the time. Um, like you see the ledger um, which gave payments um, to local fascists for killing Republicans. Um, it was a pathetic amount of money they were paid, but I mean, they, you see that on the screen. You can't deny the fact that those ledgers exist. Um, and they also, importantly, include interviews with historians of both sides who they let speak for themselves without interrupting them. Um, and frankly, the Francoist historians like Ricardo de la Sierra condemn themselves. Um, well, OK, I'm making clear my position. Um, and um, having said that, I think it's really important to try and understand the mindset of the right. That doesn't mean you condone it. I think there is a kind of feeling, it's probably easier for me to say that, not being Spanish. Um, it's very hard for a Spaniard, I think, to feel that you want to investigate the values of the right, but I think we're never going to understand um, how could people could behave in the way they did if we don't understand what were the values that made them act the way they did. I really like the work of the British historian Helen Graham um, because she does a more cultural analysis, um, trying to get inside the mindset of the right to explain um, how they could have done um, what they did, not to justify it, but simply to see that they weren't crazy, they had their value system, and from within that value system, um, what they did makes sense. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not um, something that we would condemn ethically. Um, I'm saying we in a dangerous fashion. I you know, should never use the word we without clarifying who we is. And I think, anyway, um, there's no way you can possibly um, can condone um, the um, Francoist repression, which was systematically organised at um, state level. Um, one doesn't condone the Republican violence in the first six months of the war either, but it was not carried out um, with state approval, and the state did its best to get it under control, though it took six months um, to get it under control. And all the deaths in the Republican zone were documented. Um, they were the victims were given proper burial. That was not the case um, in, the, um, in the nationalist zone. Um, with regard to television series, that's actually one of my favorite topics because I'm writing about the um, uh, soap opera Amar in Chimbo Revueltos for just the first year of it because that's 200 hours of watching and that was as much as I could cope with. Uh, but also the first series, which is originally conceived as um, a closed one year series, but it was so wildly successful it ended up being prolonged until November of last year, having started in 2000. And 
five, stretching out the time more and more and more to keep it going. Um, but it's the first year which covers uh, the um, Republic, the Civil War, and going through to 1945. Um, so it's covering the years of the worst atrocities. Um, my theory is that that um, soap opera succeeds in a way that I don't think any of the historical memory debates among intellectuals have succeeded um, because of various reasons. Um, one would be um, all the characters are depicted as agents. Absolutely nobody is a victim. Um, there may be horrible things happen to people, but they never get into the mode um, of protesting uh, they have rights because they're victims. And frankly, that is a concept which only became dominant um, with the development of international law um, in the kind of 1980s and became very strong in the 1990s. It, it, it wasn't a concept uh, at the time. Um, and um, the other thing that I particularly liked about Amarin um, Chimpuruguertos, or Loving in Troubled Times, with the English translation, um, is that... Um, it shows um, characters who are mostly not black and white. Um, it does have um, one baddie who's a crooked uh, Francoist cop. Um, though there are even moments when he sort of becomes human, though it doesn't last very long. Um, but um, it shows you the main family, um, a bourgeois family um, whose daughter um, falls in love with the Republican worker of her father's company. Um, that family represents every political point of view. I mean, her father is Francoist, her older brother is an absolute outright phalangist who volunteers for the Blue Division to fight alongside Hitler's troops against the Soviet Union, ends up becoming a victim of post-traumatic um, stress disorder uh, of, as a result of it, which doesn't make you sympathise with him, but it makes you kind of understand how unhinged he is. Um, and then she has a younger brother who it just starts to be hinted in the first season and it becomes explicit later on, um, uh, is showing signs of um, homosexual tendencies. Um, so the family com covers the whole spectrum. They have incredible arguments and disagreements, but they all insist they love each other. And that may sound absolutely trite, but I think it's really valuable statement and I think the majority of Spaniards I know come from families where there were people who fought on both sides in the Civil War. I wouldn't like to risk saying that statistically that's a majority, but it's very common. I, don't, I haven't actually read that essay, I confess, so tell me about it. And, and the importance of creeds in, this, in, 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 um, in, in the collective memory mm -hmm. and, and how it impacts on these issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, in his position, uh, which was elaborated later on by Octavio Paz, uh, goes further, and the, the, the statement that, that Octavio Paz makes, uh, just, you know, since you have read the essay, mm -hmm. to put it in context, is that uh, las creencias son las capas más profundas, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, yep. the deeper levels. Yep. So, so the question then is, since this collective memory and this question of victims hasn't really been clarified or there, there's a negation that t keeps on living in Spain, is it, it, doesn't that then uh, explain partly why Spain seems to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat mm. the same patterns of, of, of in its governance. I wouldn't say that it keeps repeating the same patterns in its so governments. I think any repetition is never the same simple. as the previous occurrence. Um, certainly the polarization has become very damaging since the early 200s and it's not getting better. Um, that was partly um, because of a, um, what you could call an exercise in competitive victimhood, but you could also um, see how the two debates feed off each other, and that was the way in which the popular party in opposition used the victims of Basque terrorism 
um, to combat the left's championing of the victims of the Francoist repression in a way that is, is very nasty um, politically. Um, your question about clients, yes, absolutely. And I think I would um, not so much use the word beliefs as, collect as imaginaries, um, something that involves affect, emotions, which is something which is harder to articulate, um, particularly to oneself, but runs very deep and one just absorbs in the family, um, in the circuits, the circles within which one grows up. Um, and, um, but I, th I think they always involve in ways that um, are kind of hard to actually pin down. And I mean, I'm very interested in working on the history of emotions um, which um, seems to me a very important historical object rather than emotions get in the way and we've got to somehow get them out of the picture in order to look at what actually happened. And it's because people have certain emotions, they do many things. Um, so I, I, I think I would call it, um, probably use the word imaginaries, which um, is kind of at the sort of threshold of consciousness, unconsciousness. Um, and it's sort of amorphous, but for that reason, um, kind of more in, insidious. And how imaginaries are created is, is a very complicated um, process. I don't know if I can give an example um, that may illustrate that. Um, it's actually in the village in Granada province where I've had a house for nearly 30 years, um, where one of the local um, villagers who is now in her early 70s um, and um, had an uncle um, very viciously murdered by um, anarchists who came in from outside the village at the start of the Civil War. Um, she's had very little education, but I mean, she's an intelligent woman who you know, would have gone places if she had had an education, uh, not afraid to speak her mind. And um, I was visiting her at the time that there happened to be a party political broadcast by the um, head of the popular party government, Mariano Rajoy, current prime minister of Spain. It was uh, a while ago at the time of municipal elections. And knowing that um, most of the people in the village are right wing, um, it was partly there. It's a village of small land, uh, small holders who saw anarchism or socialism as taking their land away. And I can understand that. Um, probably they were right. But they weren't landless peasants who had nothing to lose. Um, and um, she suddenly said to me, I don't know what to do um, at these elections. I feel I've got to exercise my right to a vote because it's important to participate as a citizen. But there's no way I can vote for Rajoy. And I was thought, what? I mean, because knowing that she does have a right wing mentality and she's part of a community which is mostly right wing, I, I was just really surprised. Um, and I sort of encouraged her to talk more about that. And um, she says that when she was young, she made a promesa, which is like a religious vow, never to vote for the left because of what happened to her uncle. And that made me wonder how many people vote because of some sense of family loyalty. Nothing to do with ideas that you support or don't. And um, that's kind of scary. But I, I mean, that's not that sort of repetition, but. Um, I, I would like to stress I don't think things that I, um, are repeated ever are identical to the way that they occurred in the previous time. There's always some sort of slippage. I was very impressed with your over 100 publications. Would you share with us <laughs> your secret of how can anyone be so productive so we can learn? <laughs> um, I don't have children, that helps. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the main secret. I've never had to do that juggling, which most women academics have to do. 
uh, and that wasn't a conscious decision, it's just the way things turned out. Um, I mean, most of those are articles, so I mean, you know, nothing like that amount of books, and a lot of my books are edited um, volumes rather than monographs. Um, the, the, the trouble is, well, yeah, I do. Uh, the trouble is that um, once you get known for doing certain things, people keep asking you to do more of the same, and that's the thing I've tried to combat by doing different things, and uh, that's actually, in many ways, a terrible mistake. I mean, I can't stop myself doing it because I get bored if I just do more of the same, and I have decided this is the last ever talk I'm going to give about historical memory because people keep asking me to talk about it, and I don't want to repeat myself any, any, any more. Also, it's because I think the debates aren't advancing in Spain. They kind of got stuck, and that's sort of upsetting. If they get unstuck, then maybe I come back to the topic. But um, if you have children, it's very difficult. <laughs> right. <laughs> on the idea of human rights as something that is modern and new, mm -hmm. and how being a, a Spaniard myself who grew up with children uh, from the war, my parents, um, I don't have a sense that they felt like they belonged to the collective memory, that that collective memory was not theirs, that, that they had to adopt it. And so you say, I'm from Spain, but you're thinking, what Spain is that, exactly. right? So um, it's like you are foreign in your own country. You don't feel like you belong because they have characterized those that lost as the non-Spaniards, as the anti-Spanish. Or simply because you are just from a uh, poor background and you know you just were caught in whatever zone you know the war started and it was summer and some people were dislocated from their home they were in the village or whatever so that is one thing and i think that generation was able to kind of move on and accept the fact of silence because you know they you know didn't want to rock the boat after franco died the next generation of the grandchildren want to remember, and they are the people that have grown in the environment of human rights and being, you know, feeling like they have, you know, they're entitled to, to their memory as well, right? So I think that's part of, of this, you know, evolution <coughs> of what is history and what is memory, that we are always looking back depending on what is the current circumstance. Exactly. And the people that were, you know, a taxi driver, for example, in the 30s, didn't have a little home in Toledo uh, to go and plant tomatoes in the 30s. But a taxi driver today in Madrid had a lot. My mom that has very little education herself would say, well, you know, I didn't have anything to wear during the during the uh, 40s, but now, you know, everybody has had access to a certain level of being comfortable. And so, you know, there are multiple layers of, of things here, you know, that, um, I don't know, it's not very articulate what I'm asking you, but I'm, I'm trying to get to the, what is the victim and what is the one that is, taking control of the memory and the official. Yeah, I, th I think one of the problems of the discourse on victimhood is it's, it, it has a sort of homogenizing impact as though you say someone's a victim, that's all you need to say about them. And it's, it's, it's not helpful to say that people are victims or perpetrators. It's also, I mean, that's why I think the question of people who colluded, uh, the massive informer system that was set up by the Franco regime, you know, with very strong rewards, like you get the goods of, or the property of the neighbor you denounce, and the very strong incentives to um, inform on your neighbors or even family mem members. Um, I think, I, I mean, victims are there. I'm not trying to pretend they weren't there. I just think there needs to be a bit more sophisticated thinking about the fact that if you say someone's a victim, that's not the only thing to, you say about them. And yes, I, mean, I have massive admiration for those people um, who were hugely victimized, and they were really tough, and they learned strategies of survival. 
I, I think survival might be, and that's why I like Kozalik's emphasis on the people, not the people who died, and of course we should remember and document that, um, but the ones who survived are perhaps the really, really interesting ones to study. How did they manage, frankly, to, when well, some didn't? Um, after the war, I mean, with you know, people literally dying of, of, of hunger in many cases, not just because of um, direct repression. Um, various other things I was jotting down, I mean, there's a whole lot in what you were saying, um, just to unpack the few things I, um, I spotted. Um, first of all, I don't think you can ever say there is only one collective memory in a country. I mean, there are huge numbers of different collective memories, and people use the term terribly glibly, um, talking about the collective memory in Spain today, I and mean, there's no such thing as a collective Spanish memory. There are um, different people who feel identified with different positions, groups, who um, and the values of those groups therefore affect the way they construct the past. Um, but I think one has to be really careful about one how he uses the term collective memory, and it's certainly not the idea that there is something in common um, between all the members of a group, and especially not of a nation, um, but it's also not the idea that the collective remembers. I mean, I, I think it's really important to remember Hulk Fack's original definition that collective memory is that of the individual in as much as he or she is a member of a group and therefore is um, constructing the past within a certain social frame. Uh, the next thing I wanted to pick up, and this is something I feel really strongly about, how we talk about silence. Um, silence can be very positive, um, and I think it's really important not to see silence as, oh, they weren't brave enough to speak out, or, oh, they should have spoken out, isn't it shameful that they didn't, why did it take so long? I mean, that first generation had really good reasons for being silent. It's why I think I'm also a little anxious about psychoanalytical models of trauma, because the reason people didn't speak was absolutely political. Um, you got punished or your children were hounded as um, children of reds publicly in the street. Um, you kept quiet uh, and there are so many stories I don't want to go into any individual one um, because of, um, I don't want to take too much time up now, but um, so many stories of people who never told their children that they'd um, fought for or been nurses for the Republic during the Civil War, and when asked why, they said, we wanted to protect you. We didn't want you to identify as children of Reds. Um, and really, you know, lacerating stories of what people kept quiet for the good of their children, or false versions of their biography they gave to their children in order to protect them from both psychological damage and political hounding. Um, so I think it's important to remember that silence can be protecting your own kin, being loyal, uh, you know, not speaking under pressure. Silence can also be a way of um, remaining faithful to your memories, or you may be silent in the public sphere, but you talk about it in the private sphere, and people who were politically active did tend to pass it on to their children. Um, not everybody did. Um, so I would never condemn anybody from, um, for having been silent, and I, I think my, there's a sort of very... This, the, the sort of memory turn has got this into rather lazy thinking of thinking that to remember is always good, to forget is always bad. I, I think one has to be really careful about seeing it in those terms. Um, the other thing you've mentioned, oops, um, the um, very changed lifestyles of Spaniards today. Um, I actually had a chunk that I took out because I thought it was going to be too long. Um, the relationship of consumerism to forgetting. I mean, the consumerist ideology which has been embraced uh, by most Spaniards today, um, which is quite understandable when there was so much hardship in the past. So I wouldn't want to condemn people um, for that. Um, but consumerism is about obsolescence, and consumerism is about the cult of the new. Um, the past is not valued in a consumerist ideology, and I, and I think that's a really important factor um, today. But you raised all sorts of important issues. No, I love, that's what I want. <laughs> Uh -huh. The economic situation right. in Spain is absolutely horrendous. Uh, 
uh, they, I don't know if you know, they have a 21% tax. Imagine we have a 7% tax in Florida, right? They have a 21% tax. So I'm wondering what the impact is on, on all of the efforts of, that have to do with uh, Memoria Historica and the, the official uh, offices and buildings that they have in different cities. Uh, like in Salamanca, I remember seeing a whole building that was giant sign outside, Memoria Historica, all the oficinas. What is the impact uh, of, of what's happening now? Last Thursday, I don't know if you're following, but last Thursday, Paris published all of those uh, secret accountings mm -hmm. of the former treasury of the of the country, uh, Bar Barcelona, huh? who had been stealing millions. I mean, he, he was, uh, they were giving money to people in the Partido Popular since the 1990s. This is scandalous. In fact, I'm so surprised that the United States press hasn't really uh, picked this up, ignoring some, such an important piece Well, of the New York Times has not had a correspondent in Spain for 20 years. I got that it's shameful. Terrible. Major news is in the news every day. Something more pages are being published every day. The entire newspaper is fo copies, photographs of, of the actual handwritten notes and so on. It's scandalous, and there have been enormous marches in Spain now asking for the dimisión, you know, for like impeachment to get rid of that he should step down right away. And, and so I'm, I'm wondering, also following up on what you were saying, that people have changed now. Uh, that perhaps some of these younger people who are there, um, whether they're Partido Popular or, or something else, or PSOE or whatever, they are now so worried about not the, you know, Memoria Historica, they're worried about what's going to be on the right yes. the next day. They cannot afford to put food, you know, at the table. And, and there's a brain drain in Spain where everybody's leaving if they can leave. Mm -hmm. So I'm very concerned about what's happening in Spain, the whole uh, institutions, the bienestar, the, the, the social, the pensions are, people kind of live on them, uh, you know, social security, the, the um, health, which was such a big, wonderful thing in Spain, and that is also now going to be privatized and it costs money. How is all of these things happening in the country that are so horrible now going to impact? I, I wouldn't want to depict a totally negative view of Spain. I mean, what gets in the press is all of that, and it's all true. But there are a lot of people doing very important things um, in Spain, very positive things as well. Um, I, um, I think you're absolutely right that um, people's, most people's concern today in Spain is the present. Um, in the time of the transition, there was a desire not to think about the past because people were focused on the future. Um, now it's because they need to think about survival in the present. Um, I don't know enough about uh, ways in which the movement of the indignados, the quince um, um has or has not uh, been involved in, for example, the Association for the Recovery of Historical Memory. My impression is that they, there is not that much into relationship with them, but I'm not enough of an expert to want to um, give a view on that. Um, I think that doesn't necessarily mean that young people who are protesting against corruption, I mean, it's 50% unemployment with people under 25, it's, it's quite horrendous. Um, I, I think it's that, um, you know, they may and probably do in many cases um, feel very strongly that it's important to know about the victims of the Francoist repression. Um, but they're mobilizing for other things right now. But again, I don't think once you see it as an either or, it's not that if you're mobilizing because of unemployment and the way the government is handling the economic crisis, that doesn't mean you're not interested in the Frankist impression, uh, repression. I mean, you can be interested in many things, but the urgency is the current economic crisis. You're absolutely right. And the um, historical memory debates have completely disappeared from the media. Uh, well, I say completely, I don't see everything in the Spanish media, I just check it out every now and then, but it was very present um, until the economic crisis. We have time for just one last question, and I don't know who raised the hand, uh, first you or someone else. So, okay, you have the last question, the, the, the last question, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, it was more like a comment, and I think it goes very well with your comment about the economic crisis. And I think that nostalgia, Mm -hmm. um, plays a big role in this. That's interesting. Uh, 
not wanting, well, not wanting to do recovery, but just saying, well, I mean, now that we're living in trouble times, um, it's like we live before, before we live better. Right. And that is so negative. Right. And lots of people do it. You know? Right. I mean, it, has, it could be left, right. Exactly. All people like my grandfather mm -hmm. that went, that when the war started, it started uh, was in, um, in Madrid, and he was so young, he didn't know what to be. He didn't know if he was a Republican or a... Mm -hmm. But then during the period, during the dictatorship, he lived well. Mm -hmm. so yes. So there's a lot of nostalgia yes. that on that, in that sense that said, well, we didn't live that bad, and now all yes. these problems with international, with the euro, with the extent, just leave us alone and yes. <laughs> kind of let's go back. I think, I think that's a really important point, and you know, thank you for raising it. I agree completely, and it does um, lead to, I mean, there are young people involved in far-right groups. Um, when you hear them talk or you look at websites, I mean, very active on websites. I've just taught a course for freshmen of um, crossing all the disciplines at um, New York University last semester. Um, where I just gave out a health warning when looking at topics like the Valley of the Fallen, for example. Um, when you find websites on the web, see who put it up. Because the, um, the, right, the far right is really good at using the web um, to, uh, for propaganda. I mean, it, it, they're frighteningly efficient uh, using the web. And um, it can be very influential if people don't look carefully at who put it up or they know, don't, they don't know what is this group. Um, that's put this completely inaccurate view of Spanish history up on the web. I mean, you know, even statistics completely wrong. I mean, totally, totally um, inaccurate. Um, and, um, I mean, that's one thing that worries me. I, and it doesn't seem to be happening now, the kind of neo-Nazi groups. Don't, I haven't seen that kind of thing reported for a while. There was more reporting about that perhaps um, several years ago. I mean, I hope that's not going to be a result, but I, I, I do agree this is something that it's um, a comforting and very unhelpful position that can be adopted by people over the political spectrum. I mean, the right has always felt that, of course, with reason. Um, but if it does encourage people on the left to also say, OK, it was better under dictatorship. I do remember there was a questionnaire, and I can't remember who issued the questionnaire, and it was several years ago asking young people um, did, what did they feel was the difference living under democracy or living under dictatorship, and a very high percentage said no difference. And that's terrifying. And that's because they've never experienced the Franco regime. Uh, but that kind of attitude really, really kind of frightens me. That's why I do think education is so important. <laughs> uh, how do you see it? Uh, well, actually, you know, uh, this the current king was chosen by Franco. Right. So everybody knows that. But it wasn't, he was endorsed, or either the constitution endorsed him, or he endorsed the constitution. So anyway, the thing is that this king is uh, is going to have to abdicate or retire. And Who died? <laughs> the prince is going to have to deal with this, uh, with this uh, memory historic uh, issue. So how do, you, how do you envision the, the future when a lot of young people are claiming, uh, you know, or, or a lot of people are trying to rescue the, the republic? Uh, how do you see how uh, the role of the prince you know, will... Uh, I, I, I mean, the, the way I'd respond to that to say, is to say that I find it really interesting how republicanism is re, uh, re-emerging in Spain as an option, uh, which um, it simply was not an option at the time of the transition. And um, uh, I'd love to see more um, of, a, of a sort of active, energetic uh, republican discourse. But at the same time, I mean, I do agree completely with Martín Izquierdo and Sánchez León's um, notion that um, to simply say we go back to the Republic of the 1930s is just not an option. Uh, I mean, it was a time of totalitarian ideologies, of political polarization um, throughout Europe. Um, that's not 
what we want. It's got to be a Republican, a Republican option worked out for today, but I do find it very encouraging that people are now, well, over the last, I don't know, five years, I don't know exactly since when, um, it is now emerging as, um, as um, part of public debate. And um, I personally think that must be good, as far as the actual monarchy is concerned. Uh, because their position is to remain above politics. I doubt if they will ever make any pronouncements about anything interesting. Uh, they're not really supposed to. Um, they're just kind of there to sort of mediate. Um, 